Hello, Monetization Nation. Welcome back to another episode with Tim Ash. In the last episode, we discussed how to create successful landing pages. In today's episode, Tim explains his entrepreneurial journey and some lessons that he would like to share with other startup entrepreneurs. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. If you're comfortable sharing, I would love to hear your entrepreneurial journey. How did you become an entrepreneur in the first place? And then tell us the story. <laughs> tell us the, the good and the bad and when you fell flat on your face and, oh, and yeah. some of your triumphs that you've you've had and you've been able to sell your business now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I'll start back with the fact that I was born in the former Soviet Union, a country that no longer exists, an empire that's fallen apart. We came here when I was a kid. I was about eight years old. My family emigrated to the U.S. and um, moved around and eventually ended up here where I am in San Diego to this day to attend University of California, San Diego. And I stayed there for graduate school. So it was a cognitive science, computer engineering, double major. And I studied, I guess what you'd call neural networks or deep learning or AI, artificial intelligence, that, that sort of stuff in graduate school. Almost got my PhD, but I was working in big companies and they're really just kind of a soul killing enterprise. And I realized I didn't want to do that. I never intended to teach at a university, so I didn't need a PhD in computer science. So after seven years in the PhD program, I quit and I started my first business, which was in the early dot-com days. And uh, we were helping launch new startups, serve on their uh, board of directors, help them raise their first round of VC money, that sort of thing, early days. And I remember I, I took down 2,000 square feet of office space, bought a desk, got an internet and phone connection and called up my girlfriend and they said, hey, I'm running around the office naked. You know why? Because I can. It's my freaking office. <laughs> you know, so I guess it was that bit of entrepreneurial insanity, like I can do this internet marketing thing better than working for other people. Uh, and now that's been the roller coaster in there over the last 25 years or so. It's been a lot of, I guess what you'd call pivots or just uh, adjustments, wrenching adjustments to survival. Um, and so I had been running professional services firms for a long, long time. Along the way, I started an international conference series, wrote the books, did a lot of speaking. And I guess the one thing that stands out for, through all of that from an entrepreneurial standpoint is this balance between saying, screw you, I'm going to do it anyway, which every entrepreneur needs, and throwing good money after bad and saying, you know, I, maybe it's time to go do something else. Yeah. And that's always the tension because if you listen to your critics or your mother-in-law, I mean, people come up with a thousand reasons why your idea is not going to work. And at some level, you have to plow on you know, in spite of that. Right. But then, like I said, it's where does it become stubbornness or where does it become the hard way of doing things and are yep. there better opportunities and cut your losses. And so that's the tension for me that I've tried to navigate. So where is that fine line? How do you know when to listen to other people when they say your idea is dumb and how do you know when to ignore it and just keep moving forward? <laughs> well, I saw this great little meme on Facebook. Somebody posted recently, and they had a picture of um, uh, Morgan Freeman. I don't know if it's actually his quote, because uh, you never know with memes. But I love the quote itself, which is, never take criticism from someone you wouldn't go to for advice. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was like really profound. It's like, yeah, that, that's wise. You know, um, so, you know, I, I have mentors. I respect their opinion a lot. I have trusted colleagues, um, people that I feel are of the same breadth of experience, intelligence, depth uh, to them. And those are the people I listen to and everybody else. Uh, yeah, not, not so much. <laughs> That's right. I remember when I started my first business and people telling me uh, that my market was too small. I was going after too small of a niche and I needed to pick a much bigger market. And um, but I was able to become number one in the niche, right? I was able to, to, to be the, the category king. And, and uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot of wisdom sometimes in ignoring the people that 
don't quite understand why you're doing what you're doing. Well, I think what you just talked about is another really important thing which, uh, for entrepreneurs, which is focus. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's, it's saying no nine out of 10 times. And even yeah. when we did conversion rate optimization in my agency, my former agency, Site Tuners, um, you know, people would say, hey, do you do mobile? No. Do you do the mobile web, that is? Do you do apps? No. I mean, it was always like, no, this is what we do, desktop web experiences. Eventually, we did move to mobile when, when the traffic went there. But um, it's just saying no. Like, can you build us a custom application, software application? No. <laughs> you know, it's just it, you have to really be clear about who you serve and your value prop to them. And I think that um, having that laser-like focus lets you cut through the clutter. You look at the Marvel superheroes and no superhero has every superpower, right? Everybody's got their niche super power. When you focus like you're talking about in business, it's finding our superpower and focusing on that because nobody can be an expert in everything. Nobody can. Well, and of course, you know, area under the curve, you can't be an expert at everything. That That's absolutely true. But what I'm talking about is your ability to cut through the clutter and for people to remember what you stand for, yep. the care, okay? Is they say, well, um, you know, we're a productivity software solution or we're a digital agency. I was like, so we're a thousand other businesses, yeah, big deal. Right. You know, but again, if we do pay-per-click um, for only um, consumer packaged goods, uh, companies that are VC funded and uh, trying to break into their markets, I mean, that's our thing. Okay. Yep. If you heard about that and you were in that category, you go, great. Where have you been all my life? Right. Yep. Instead of, oh, another, you know, digital marketing agency. Uh, going back to your entrepreneurial journey, any other elements, any other fun stories from your entrepreneurial <laughs> journey you'd like to share? Well, I don't know that, that they were fun. Um, there were times, there were definitely several times when and, uh, it gets harder to be an entrepreneur once you have a family and once you have kids. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there were times I had discussions with my wife, like if you're not consistently bringing home this amount of money by this date, then you have to go get a real job. You know, so, so, <laughs> and uh, luckily I never had to do that. And I said, well, okay, I'll commit to that, honey. But uh, just understand that'd be like being caught in a bear trap. I'd rather chew my leg off then you know then go back to working in the corporate world so not that you're doing it alone but belief in yourself that you get after being an entrepreneur for a long time uh, but it doesn't mean that the material success comes with it and in fact that's no longer my criteria for measuring meaning or or uh, the importance of something in my life at all uh, but i'd say i probably would have made a lot more money in the corporate world than i did as an entrepreneur so are you glad you did it? Yeah, I think, you know, at my funeral, they're going to put on that Frank Sinatra, I did it my way song. And yeah, that's a good way to go out. Well, one of the things that, that I want to talk about is kind of marketing ethics. One of the reasons actually that I wrote the Unleash Your Primal Brain book was, was kind of to level the playing field uh, for consumers and individuals. You know, we're being manipulated by large companies, by media enterprises, and they're all trying to kind of strip mine us for, for value and profit and, you know, the Facebooks of the world and so on. And, and as marketers, we're kind of helping them do that. Think about what marketers do. We make it more efficient for companies to persuade you to do something, which really means taking money from you, putting it in their pocket as opposed to their competitor's pocket, right? So there's really nothing inherently noble about marketing or growing a business. I mean, uh, so I want to just consider the whole kind of premise behind what we're talking about. Okay, we're here I am on the monetization podcast, right? But to be a bit of a contrarian, what's so great about that? It just means we're speeding off the global extinction cliff even faster by doing more unsustainable things, right? And so I think that we really need to step back and think about ethics um, of manipulation of people, of algorithmic stuff, of finding patterns which are not you know, ethically acceptable. For example, back decades ago, you used to have redlining. So people in minority neighborhoods couldn't get mortgages. You just like, if you're in this zip code, tough luck, we're not lending. Uh, well, the same kind of things can come out of artificial intelligence and algorithms, the same kind of biases, because they're being trained on data sets from the real world. And all those biases are built into that. So I see some of that, that I'm, I see a lot of that, that I'm not comfortable with. And I'm, I'm trying hard to not go that direction. Um, 
maybe we can, without naming any names or throwing anybody specifically under the bus, maybe we can talk about some examples of some things that, that entrepreneurs might want to consider the ethics around before they do. And so for example, um, I see a lot of people when they're doing funnel creation, they'll, they'll put a, a timer to try to create scarcity and say the offer is only good for X period of time when you know, the next day, the same timer will be running with the same deal. Falsely representing something to create artificial scarcity just to get someone to buy now. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, that that's an example of the kind of things we have to think about. Um, and um, if it works, would you do it? That's the question. Before you even try it. Um, because it might work. And then when, when you have that money already, that campaign r- running and humming and making you money, are you going to want to unplug it? No, yeah. you're not. So it's a lot. So what I'm suggesting is um, you question this stuff before you do it, before you think about doing it. If, if it works, will I be okay with that as, as an end result and to continue to do it before you're committed to the money? I love it. Before the money even becomes a factor. Yeah, because it's going to be a lot harder to your job, your business, everything depends on the success, quote unquote. Uh, uh, so it's going to be a lot harder to unplug it. Yeah. And, and my perspective is if going back to our previous conversation about credibility, if credibility is the most important marketing principle happening today, which it may or may not be, um, is it ethical to say or do something that when our customers discover the reality, we lose credibility, right? Is, is that ethical to give them a deadline that when they come back to our site tomorrow, they see the, the new deadline started? Uh, uh, I mean, look, there, there are some things we did for clients that were definitely gray area and they insisted on it. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. We had someone in the highly regulated industry, financial services. And so there was a, okay, you, you have to have the disclaimer, this, this disclaimer text above the button, right? Okay. And you can't make it smaller than a certain font size. And you can't make it less contrasty than a certain, you know, color, yep. color, tonal difference, right? And so you know what our client asked us to do? So there's a, a landing page, a form, and a button at the bottom of the page. They said, well, can you put the disclaimer in the header of the page? Because people don't look at headers. No one looks at a header and it's yeah. facially disconnected from the form. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the form. You're certainly not considering it in the context of the pushing that button anymore. Yeah. And or so put it right next to the ad banner because no one looks at the ad banner. Right, right. Yeah. Turn it into a flashing ad. No one, everyone will ignore <laughs> it. Yeah. And so, you know, technically it met the SEC guidelines. It was it was above the button. It wasn't below yeah. the button. So it had been quote unquote considered before pressing the button. Um, in reality, it's not. So that, that's, that's on the black side of the line for me, you know, yeah. not, 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 not the white hat. It's, it's definitely evil. Um, and it made them a lot of money. Um, and so I, I just, I feel bad participating in that other times you know, having been in an agency, we saw all kinds of clients and all kinds of industries. And there are some things that um, the world views or the kind of agenda that certain companies are pushing. I was personally like grossed out by, uh, and that was tough because again, they're paying us money to do it. And yep. I need to you know help my family and, but it's just like, what do you want to participate in? There have been a lot of kind of employee revolts, I believe, at Google or Microsoft. Where there are some things, some programs that they're doing for like image recognition and AI for defense applications. And people are like, yeah, I don't want a drone to fly, you know, C4 explosive up my butt because it recognized my face, you know, and I don't want to be a part of that. And so they're actually kind of employee revolts inside of large tech companies against working on some of this stuff. And I think that's going to continue to happen. You know, What secrets could you share about calls to action on landing pages? Well, I don't know that they're secrets, but uh, some things to consider. Uh, for example, if, if you consider call to action to be the button, and the, the text on a button should almost always be what's in it for me. Mm-hmm. So it should complete the phrase, I want to do something. I want to fill in the blank. I want to... Uh, schedule my appointment. I want to buy it now. You see, that stuff works. But I want to submit. 
Not so much, right? Well, yeah. Unless you're into that kind of kinky BDSM or, or stuff. Click you know, here. I want to click here. Yeah, you're I want right. to click here. Said no one ever, right? It's like it's a button. Yeah, that's what you do. You click it. So there's some real low hanging fruit for stupidity on what buttons say. So yeah. clean that up first. Um, the other thing I would say is um, a lot of times style overcomes function. Right now we have these kind of minimalist websites that have. Uh, photographic backgrounds or even like some moving video backgrounds. And then there's this very thin line and a little white text on it. And that's the button that's see-through. In other words, it shows the background behind it. So it's like, if you want me to notice the button, then why would you make it low contrast? Yeah. If it's the most important thing on the page, why is it visually not the most important thing on the page and competing for attention with that giant image or you know, God forbid video in the background behind it? So I think that um, calls to action need to be appropriately prominent. You have to have a really clear sense of the visual hierarchy on the page. And you, that's why you have to tone down all of that other, all those other visual boogers, as I call them, that we talked yep. about earlier. So when we design landing pages at my former agency, we would do it in wireframes first because we'd agree on the use of real estate, relative position and prominence of stuff. Because once you start getting to the visual treatment, everybody has an opinion. All of a sudden, the CEO comes in, well, I like purple. I think that button should be purple. Oh, great. You run a business and you're a color theory expert. Congratulations. You know, so, but if it's at the wireframe stage and you get people to agree on what, how it should look functionally and what elements should be on the page and it's just all boxes and crosses and stuff, it's a lot easier to agree on that first and then stick to it. Then when you it's just coloring in yep. the dots. Or coloring in, sorry, the you know, the paint by numbers drawing, I guess, if you will. So I know I asked you that question about clients. Any success stories from clients that implemented some of the stuff that I'm proudest of is when we were able to change the culture of the client, um, and some of the our best work was conversely buried because the clients didn't want to do it without naming any names. Dropbox. Uh, we were designing <laughs> a, a certain landing page um, for. Um, a paid um, file sharing product. So there's the free one and then there's the paid one. Yeah. And it was like, it's so wonderful to use the paid version of our product and had a generic open laptop in the background as the, as the background image. And they said, no, it's not, there's nothing particularly wonderful about file sharing. It's just not that exciting. So instead we designed this page that had two columns. One was kind of like the negative stuff, the before, and the other one was the after. And it was sort of like life without it, file sharing. Uh, you can't attach certain things to an email because they're too big. You don't know what the latest version of stuff is and who's seen it and all of these other problems had a long list of problems. And then with that product, okay, all of a sudden, you know, all those problems go away. So creating that contrast is a huge part of marketing. And what we were told is, no, that's off brand for us. We don't say anything negative. It's like you, so you can't even say life sucks without our product. That's too negative, seriously. And so we've had a lot of ideas that were kind of stillborn because the corporate culture rejected it. Yeah. You know, and I, so I think uh, another tip for, for marketers, uh, really advocate for more latitude for testing different ideas, just because it's not in your brand guidelines. You know, you're on the front lines, you know, what really works. You're in the trenches that should be informing the brand guidelines. It's not like some static document that was written on stone tablets and brought down from Mount Sinai. You know, it's, it's not like that. Thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, we need to be able to sort through the good and the bad criticism. Number two, we should only take criticism from people from whom we would take advice. Number three, we need to make sure we aren't so prideful that we ignore good suggestions. Number four, we need to learn how to trust ourselves. Number five, we each have our own unique superpower. We need to discover what that is and learn how to use it to benefit our customers. Number six, as an entrepreneur, it is important to determine our marketing ethics right off the bat, especially before money is involved. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Tim or connect with him, you can visit him on his website, timash.com. 
For more about his latest book, you can also go to primalbrain.com. Did you like today's episode? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, please subscribe to Monetization Nation on our podcast or YouTube channel. And number three, please connect with me, Nathan William, on LinkedIn. What advice do you have for startup entrepreneurs? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your ventures. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.